Welcome. Let me briefly talk about a very famous problem in mathematics called the Basel problem, actually first posed in 1644 by an Italian mathematician, Mengoli. And he asked, what is the sum of the reciprocals of all the square numbers? Now he had enough mathematics under his belt to uh, be able to say that this was actually a finite answer, but he didn't know what the number actually was. Um, in later decades, uh, this became known as a particular example of a function, the zeta function, it's been known as zeta 2, which in general, zeta k is the sum of the reciprocal of the kth powers. So basically, Mengoli was asking, what's the value of zeta 2? Well, um, it took some 90 years, but Euler actually managed to find a way to actually compute this particular sum. And he did it in a way that's actually completely inspired, completely brilliant, but, you know, mathematicians today would question his techniques when they have actually gone back and proved that everything he's, he claims can be justified in great technical detail. So, uh, we, you know, we no need to take away from Euler's brilliance here. Let me just go through what Euler did, and I'll avoid the technical details myself, but just show you his brilliance at hand. All right, let's go from a slightly circuitous route. Let me ask you a different question. Suppose I asked for a polynomial from you, and I wanted this polynomial to have uh, two properties, that at zero, it has value one, and that this, value, this polynomial actually equals zero at x equals a, b, c, and d. Well, you have no trouble constructing an example of such a beast. What you probably do is do the obvious thing, get the zeros first, x minus a, x minus b, x minus c, x minus d. Great, advantages at those four points. Unfortunately, uh, when I put x equals zero in this formula, I don't get one, but we can rectify that by dividing by the numerator that would result. There it is, there's an example of a polynomial that does the trick. Uh, let me just uh, simplify this, well, rearrange this a little bit. x minus a divided by a, I could rewrite this as x a minus 1, uh, x over b minus 1, x over c minus 1, x minus d over 1. And what I'm going to do is, um, I'm just going to rearrange this one little step further, um, just multiply everything through by negative 1, uh, because I've got an even number of terms I know I'm correct. The only reason I'm doing this here um, is that it makes it very clear that the leading coefficient is 1. If I were to expand this product out, uh, the constant term would be choosing the constant term of each set of parentheses, it will be 1. So if I actually asked for five zeros, I could follow this latter formula here and it will do the trick for me. I have a constant term of 1 and clearly we have uh, zeros at a, x equals a, x equals b, x equals c, x equals d, and x equals e. Alright, so there we go. There's a general technique for finding what a polynomial must be if it has P of 0 is 1 and specified zeros. So Euler is going to take that and apply that technique to all sorts of polynomials, including ones of infinite degree, that is, infinite series. That's the questionable part. But you know, blithely going along, let's do it. And one particular polynomial Euler thought to do, work with was sine of x. Whoops, where's my pen? We know as an infinite degree polynomial this is x minus x cubed on 3 factorial plus x to the 5 on 5 factorial, and so on. All right, grand. Um, it's zeros, we know it's zeros. Uh, sine of x is 0 at 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi. But the only trouble with this particular polynomial, when I put an x equals 0, it doesn't equal 1. So what all I thought to do is let's divide both sides by x and work with this polynomial instead. 1 minus x squared on 3 factorial, plus x to the 4th on 5 factorial, and so on. Now that polynomial, clearly if I put x equals 1 into the, at least the right-hand side, x equals 0 into the right hand side, out pops the value 1. And this guy has zeros, well I removed the zero, x equals 0 as a 0, it has these guys as zeros. Well by the work we just did, this must be the polynomial of the form 1 minus x over pi, 1 minus x over negative pi, 1 minus x over 2 pi, just going through all the zeros in turn, 1 minus x over negative 2 pi, dot dot dot, and so on forever. Uh, these first two terms are really 1 minus x over pi times 1 plus x over pi. So by a difference of 2 squared, this is 1 minus x squared on pi squared. The next two terms, I can do the same trick, 1 minus x squared on 4 pi squared. Next two terms, I didn't write down, but there would be 1 minus x minus 9 pi squared, and so on. So there we have it. Sine x over x must be this infinite product. Well, I'm going to draw, see if I can box this whole thing in. Well, all I said, since I'm willing to believe this, out pops the solution to the Basel problem. Because look, let's actually expand that infinite product we just created on the right. Let me just get rid of all this junky stuff. I don't need it right now. Okay. So if I expand the right-hand side, I'll do it in green pen, expand this. Um, the constant term will be choosing 1, 1, 1, 1 in every term, so it definitely is 1. And then there'll be stuff with x squareds in it. In fact, I'll work with minus x squareds because to get an x squared term, I need to choose an x squared term in one set of parentheses and one thereafter. 
So I can either do that by choosing the first set of parentheses, which I guess have a factor of minus 1 over pi squared. So 1 over pi squared. Or I could choose the x squared term in the second parentheses and 1 everywhere else. It gives me uh, plus a 1 over 4 pi squared, because the minus sign is taken care of there. Or I could choose um, x squared here. Uh, well, that's negative x squared, that is a 9 pi squared, 1 over 9 pi squared, and so on. So if I actually expand out the product on the right here, I know it must have x to squared term with this coefficient. And I can keep going if I wish. But look, I know what this, this coefficient of x squared must be. It's right here, look at it. It must be negative 1 over 6. So this term here must be 1 sixth. Well, I've got a pi squared in the way, but if I multiply both sides by pi squared, I'm left with 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 16 and so on must be pi squared over 6. That's the value of theta 2. Very, very clever. Actually, this formula we have so far just can be taken a little bit further. Um, John Wallace actually came with a very interesting formula for pi. Uh, he used an infinite a continued fraction, if I recall correctly, but actually we got it right here as well. Let's take this formula, sine x over x equals this infinite product, and choose a very specific value for x. Let's work with x equals pi over 2. Well, sine of 90 degrees is 1, so the left-hand side is 1 over pi over 2, so I'm going to have 2 over pi equals this infinite product. Well, it's going to be 1 minus, put x equals pi over 2, pi squared's cancel, 1 over 4 times uh, 1 minus pi squared over 2, pi over 2 squared, pi squared's cancel, 1 minus 1 on 4 times 4, 1 minus 1 on 4 times 9, and so on. I think it's a little swift there. Uh, what are these fractions? 1 minus a quarter is 3 quarters. 1 minus uh, a sixteenth is 15 sixteenths. 1 minus a 36 is 35 36, and so on. So actually, 2 over pi is given by this product. And what, how Wallace actually expressed this by inverting it and saying instead, pi over 2 is 4, 2, 2, over 3, 1 times 3, times uh, 16, 4 times 4, over 15, 3 times 5, times 36, 6 times 6, over 35, 5 times 7, and so on. There's Wallace's formula. Very, very clever indeed. All right, well, we equated the coefficient of x squared in this product. I wonder if there's some interesting formula that can come out of equating the coefficient of x to the fourth. Do you have the expa patience to expand this out in terms of the fourth powers? I wonder what's hidden there. Wonderful little mystery. Thanks.